Coming up on this episode, outlining some key lineup questions for the Golden State Warriors entering next season and why it reiterates the need for them to get Lowry Markkinen. Speaking of Markkinen, I'll have the latest trade buzz on him as the waiting game continues, plus some thoughts on Summer League as the Warriors won the California Classic yesterday. Welcome to the Golden State with Mates podcast. I wanted to start today uh, going through some lineup questions for the Warriors next season, and that'll dive a bit more into some more Larry Markin discussion, which you guys are probably getting sick of, but hey, you know, we're probably going to be waiting around here till August 6th. So we've got a few weeks, buckle up, there's still plenty of stuff to be talked about. Uh, I want to start with a bit of a, I don't want to start on a negative, but I'm just going to have to, I don't usually do it, but I have a bit of a gripe to pull with Steve Kerr, who was on 95.7 The Games, Will and Dibs yesterday. I'm speaking about the Warriors roster uh, and the rotation and, and the lineup questions that we all have heading into next season. And Steve views it as exciting, the fact that they're going to go into training camp in October and there's going to be jobs available. There's going to be opportunity for players to press their case for significant roles next season and that outside Steph and probably Draymond, you know, there aren't set roles necessarily on the team right now. Steve views that as exciting. I view that as significant instability that doesn't lend itself to winning an NBA championship. That is how I view it. And that is exactly what plagued the Warriors last season. It was. It was, this roster is deep. We've got 11, 12 guys who can all play. It helps when we've got injuries and other issues going on. But there's not enough higher level talent. There isn't a hierarchy as such beyond Steph and, and again, maybe Draymond. There's not the stability required to be a successful regular season team to be to get yourself initially a high spot in the Western Conference and then obviously to push forward into a deep playoff run. If you look at the previous few NBA champions, they are all defined by a set starting five and a pretty set rotation generally like just going into the season. It's not necessarily they find out what their starting five is halfway through and they mix and match until they finally find the right combination, which is really what the Warriors were doing last season. So many different lineup uh, combinations eventually found a successful one going with Steph, Clay, Wiggs, Kaminga, Draymond in the second half of the season. Then JK gets injured. Uh, Even when he comes back, they decide to go to Trace instead uh, because they obviously like the defensive capacity it gives them with Draymond next to a genuine big man. I understand that. Uh, But there's so many more question marks like going into next season. And again, you look at the recent NBA champions, you look at the Boston Celtics. They have got a clear hierarchy of, okay, two big dogs, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Three excellent high-level great starters, Derek White, Drew Holiday, Chris Stapps, Porzingis a bona fide six man in our Horford who can step in and play a starting role whenever Porzingis or whoever else is injured. Then they've essentially got Pritchard and and, and Sam Hauser as their seventh and eighth. Like they have got a defined eight, right? And then it's, you know, Xavier Tillman and Luke Cornett or whatever else from there. But it's like a set top eight. It's a set top two. It's a set starting five. It's a bona fide six man and it's a bona fide seventh and eighth man, right? You go back to the previous season, the most used lineup, I believe, during the regular season in 2022-23 was the Denver Nuggets starting five. Jamal Murray, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, Nikola Jokic. Even if you want to go back to the Warriors 21-22 championship, once Clay returned from injury in January, the line, the starting lineup was Steph Clay. Wiggs, Draymond, Loon. And it didn't deviate outside from that unless there was an injury or come the NBA Finals when they wanted a bit more shooting on the floor outside Loon and they went with Lotto Porter Jr. Right, so I think it really, like Steve can say, oh, it's exciting, you know, there's opportunity available for guys, you know, we, we don't know necessarily what we're doing at this stage and then that that therefore means that guys can, can press for spots. Uh, it's great that there's a, you know, 12, 13, 14 guys that can play. And yeah, that is a blessing in in some ways. As I said on last episode, it will mean that the Warriors will be able to cover injuries and other issues when they come, as they will throughout an 82-game regular season. But I still think 
it says a lot about how successful you can be if you can go into a season knowing, okay, here are our five guys. This is who we are going to be rather than spending the entire season trying to mix and match and work out what actually your best combinations are. And so that that's just a gripe that I wanted to start with because I do not see that as a positive like Steve Kerr outlined in his interview yesterday. I just don't see it as positive. You can try and spin it whichever way you want, but it is literally the biggest issue from the Warriors last season is that they just never had a stable, consistent starting five or closing five for that matter that lends itself to being a very, very good team. It just isn't. So let's get more into this because I've just come off listening to the last, uh, the latest uh, Warriors Plus Minus podcast with the Athletics Anthony Slater and Marcus Thompson. So they were talking about obviously the starting five. Uh, they were talking about different combinations at the two guard spot, which I'm after what I just said. I'm more okay with saying like if there's one spot available in the starting lineup, that is like and there's that's up for grabs. Like that's fine in my opinion. So you look at the two guard spot. There's multiple options that the Warriors could go with. It's probably either going to be Brandon Pajemski or D'Anthony Melton. And there's a chance, albeit less likely, that it could be Moses Moody or Buddy Hill. Right? So there are options there. And I'm okay if, if you've got one starting spot and you and you say, yep, we've got three or four guys. You guys can battle that out in training camp, see who wins it, whatever else, and, and over preseason. Uh, I, that's okay. But when you've only got like two spots in Steph and Draymond and the, the other three spots are all up in the air, that's when it just gets too inconsistent and unstable for me. And so the real question comes down to the front court, right? And Slater and Thompson both uh, outlined their expectation that the front court is likely to be Andrew Wiggins, Jonathan Kaminga, Draymond Green, which, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare scenario either way, in my opinion. Because I think it's completely unsustainable to ask Draymond Green to enter an 82-game season as the starting center. He's 34 years of age with a lot of miles on his body. He's six foot six. Do you really want him banging against seven foot blokes on a nightly basis? You just don't. Like that is completely unsustainable for me. And again, go back to when Kaminga went out. Trace came in. Warriors were really good defensively. Draymond, as individually, was really good defensively with, with Trace next to him. And then, obviously, when JK came back, he came off the bench. But the issue with that is, like, if you go back to what you ended last season with, with Wiggins, Green, Jackson, Davis, what are you doing with Kaminga? <laughs> like, you have to give him... Like, if he's going to be on this team, you have to give him the runway as a starter entering his fourth year. If he starts next season off the bench, I will lose my, I won't swear, but you know where I'm, where I'm coming from, right? Like you cannot do that. You cannot do that. So it's like, which choice are you going to make? Are you going to make the unsustainable choice of having Draymond Green at center as a 6'6 guy at 34 years old, entering an 82 game season? Or are you going to play TJD alongside him and alleviate that issue, but have the issue of bringing Kaminga off the bench, which you simply cannot do either? And so this reiterates, absolutely reiterates, the Warriors need for Larry Markkinen. It absolutely does. Because Larry Markkinen isn't the rim protector shot blocker that TJD is, but he is a genuine seven-foot size, which makes it a lot more viable to have him and Draymond, and then his shooting ability and overall offensive ability allows you to have Kaminga to play more at the three, which you can't at the moment do because of the lack of spacing between if you're playing Kaminga at the three, Green at the four, Jackson Davis at the five. Like You, can, you can't do that with the spacing unless Kaminga is going to come out and start shooting you know, mid-high level 30% from three on reasonable volume and Draymond's going to shoot 40% again from three, which he did last season, but I don't think we should be banking on that. That is like, that cannot happen at this point. I even like heard there's been some talk and the guys from the athletic were speaking about on the podcast as well. Like, could you go, we're talking about the two guard debate. Well, could you go Steph and then could you go Wiggins at the two, Kaminga at the three, Draymond at the four, Jackson Davis at the five. Now, I think defensively, that'd be pretty good. That'd be a very good unit. And you'd have to be 
diving into the defensive side of the ball like as much as possible there. Like you have to basically tell yourself, okay, we're going to be at best league average offensively, at best. We're hoping that, hey, Steph Curry, one of the greatest offensive players of all time, he's almost single-handedly, along with another jump from JK, like those guys, those two guys in particular, are going to help us be a league average offense. But defensively, we've got this length, all this length and size now, which we don't normally have, that will allow us to be probably not even like top 10, probably has to be top five defense. Has to be top five defense if you're going to lean that much into it. That is intriguing. Again, I just don't think like you are asking so much of Steph on the offensive side of the ball in that scenario because the teams are just going to sag off. Like teams were sagging off Wiggins last season. Um, He would have to get back to like close to 40% from three. JK and Draymond I just spoke about in terms of their shooting. Like there'd be so much pressure on Steph in a way that, like, is unsustainable, similar to what I was just speaking about with Draymond and and asking him to play center. So, I mean, there's so many different lineup combinations that the Warriors, and this this is the issue, again, is that, you know, you've got 12 guys, 13, 14 guys that could probably play. If you look at the 14 man roster right now and you ask, okay, who is, like, who's left over, who's out of the rotation. Let's say you enter next season with with a 10-man rotation, which, I mean, early in the season, you might extend that out to 11, potentially even. But if you're looking at the four guys that miss out, I think it would, I mean, the 13th and 14th guys on the roster are clearly Lindy Waters the third and, and Guy Santos, so you park them to one side. And then, honestly, it's either, it's, it's probably Loon. It's probably Loon, particularly if you're going to start a front court of... Uh, Wiggins, Kaminga, Draymond, like then TJD's coming off the bench. TJD, assuming, will be ahead of Loon again. Uh, therefore, it makes it hard to have both of those guys coming off the bench. So you'd say Loon would be another one out of the rotation. And then it's either GP2 or Moody, really. And I'd like to think if Moody's still there, you've got, you've got to be giving him opportunity. So it might be GP2. And this is, again, why, like, in combination, GP2 and Luna making $17.1 million next season. Like, that is... You can you can do marketing for those two guys. Like, imagine if you just did those two guys and all the picks for marketing. Like, that would be unbelievable. Now, the Jazz are not going to go for that. But that's that just goes to, like, show you that, hey, you've got basically $17.1 million in expiring salaries on two guys that might not even be in your rotation. And that, therefore, you need to do something with that. Like you need to do something with that from a trade standpoint. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, reiterating the, obviously the need for for Markinen, uh and his shooting, obviously in the front court to allow JK to play at the three, uh, and obviously the defensive. He's again, he's not a rim protector, not a shot blocker, but he's seven foot tall. He has averaged eight point two and eight point six rebounds in each of the last two seasons, so he's a strong rebounder. That'd be the ideal scenario for the Warriors. The latest in terms of him. Slater mentioned the Warriors still as the premier team chasing Larry Markkinen at the moment. Uh, still, like if he is to be traded, you'd still think that the Warriors are in prime position to be that team. The Spurs, like there's obviously a lot of talk about Spurs, you know, having the potential of trumping any offer that the Warriors could put up. Uh, so that is, you know, still in the mix, no doubt about that. But I think, you know, whether they're willing to go all in, not all in necessarily, but to give up a lot of their future assets right now. Like they might just wait another year, see what Wemby can do next season. I, I would actually, if I was them, I would pull the trigger. I would pull the trigger and say, yep, let's get marketing in. Because I think they should be fully maximizing Wemby while he's on a rookie contract. Like the guy's going to be making, what, $12 million a year over the next three years. I'd be maximizing that because he's going to be probably the best defensive player in the league next season. And he's going to be putting up probably 22, 23 points a game minimum, especially now playing alongside Chris Paul. You've just brought in Harrison Barnes. You've still got Devin Vassell. If you can get Markkinen, and I think the, um, uh, Zach Lowe and Tim McMahon were talking on the low post uh, about the need for the Spurs to give up Vassell in a Markkinen trade. I mean, if they could do it without Vassell, then wow. <laughs> like, Could you imagine like Chris Paul, Devin Vassell, Harrison Barnes, Larry Markkinen, Victor Wembanyama? That's a that's a five. That that's a that's could be a playoff team. That could be a playoff team. And that and that is another issue for the Warriors and why they have to be 
kind of desperate for marketing because if he goes to the Spurs, not only have they missed out on marketing, but all of a sudden you might be viewing the Spurs as a better team than the Warriors heading into next season. And all of a sudden the task of trying to make the playoffs becomes all, all that all that much harder. So, uh, yeah, Warriors still the premier team. Spurs, next likely de- destination. Uh, Slater thinks that the, the Kings are probably more so out of the picture now after obviously acquiring six-time All-Star DeMar DeRozan over the past week. Interesting that uh, Kerr in the interview, as I spoke about before, uh, he stated yesterday that Kaminga, or didn't state specifically, but he was asked about Jonathan Kaminga uh, and his involvement in trade talks. And Steve answered it in a more broader way by saying, look, everyone, essentially everyone is involved in trade talks unless you name Steph Curry. And so basically confirming that Jonathan Kaminga is part of trade discussions, which is the right approach, absolutely. Like, Jonathan Kaminga, of course, is can be involved in trade discussions if, you know, not that it can work financially, but, you know, if the Bucks said, here's Giannis for Kaminga, of course the Warriors are going to listen to that. So they would listen to heaps of stuff about Kaminga, but it doesn't mean that they won't put an incredibly high price or high value on his head that suggests that, okay, you're probably going to have to pay overs for this guy. You're going to have to give us a big asset uh, in return to be for us to give up this guy to the point where it would be silly for you to do that deal. So he is essentially untouchable in that in that sense. So uh, that was interesting because, again, it's not a surprise. It's the right approach to take. But the fact that he you know, blatantly acknowledged that, yeah, Kaminga is in trade talks essentially and everyone else is aside from Steph or everyone else can be aside from Steph at least, uh, that blatant acknowledgement, I suppose, came to perhaps as a surprise to many. Uh, I don't necessarily view it as such. I think it's the right approach to take. This is a Warrior roster, as I just spoke about, that really doesn't have a hierarchy, doesn't have any high-level players right now aside from Steph Curry. Kaminga can become that guy. Pods could become that guy. They're not there right now. And so do the Warriors try and obviously get a second offensive star, as they have been doing with Mark and and previously Paul George. Um, I did want to mention something as well that's been doing the rounds on social media over the last couple of days. I didn't really want to get into it, but it's intriguing to discuss. And as I said uh, earlier, that this stuff could be going on for another few weeks, so it's it's worth mentioning. Uh, I, I tend to want to listen to the guys from The Athletic or anyone from ESPN or in, um, NBA Insider Mark Stein, but Brett Siegel did have, of Clutch Points did have a report uh, a couple of days ago, which suggested that the Warriors are trying to deal Andrew Wiggins to a third team, get a, a pick or two uh, back for him, and then on trade that as part of uh, a marketing trade, because right now the Warriors are only eligible to trade two uh, unprot- unprotected or whatever protection they want to put on it, two first-round picks in the future, uh, and a bunch of pick swaps as well. So Danny Ainge probably going to want more than that, so can the Warriors find a way to get another first-round pick or two? So there was that report. Uh, I'm not sure how much I want to... Again, I'm not saying that Seagull's lying at any, at any point, but I just find it difficult to envisage that another NBA team is going to give up picks for Andrew Wiggins. Like, I think the Warriors would have to attach picks to get off Andrew Wiggins' contract. So I, I can't see how that happens. I literally cannot see how that happens. I was listening to Locked On Warriors podcast yesterday, and Colin Mills suggested the Cleveland Cavaliers as a potential destination for Wiggs. Obviously, drafted him number one overall before moving him almost immediately to the Timberwolves for Kevin Love. That would be an interesting kind of reunion of sorts, if you'd call it that. Uh, I think it makes some sense. Like um, Kyle was talking about, I was like, yeah, I, I can see that from a Cavs perspective. They could certainly do with another kind of three and D wing. Um, try and take a bit of that perimeter defense, um, the, those perimeter defense problems off Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland. So I can I can see that. So I jumped on the trade machine last night and I was kind of looking through because really here you've got to try and find some bad contracts. Like if a team is going to give up a pick for Andrew Wiggins, you essentially need to find worse contracts that teams are therefore going to you know give up a pick or two for, and the Cavs really like, they don't have a bad contract. Like Donovan Mitchell's worth what he's making in the extension. He just got Darius Garland's worth what he's on. Jared Allen, the same, like they don't have any bad contracts. The only thing I was 
thinking and cows would have to be probably drunk to do this but maybe it's in the realm of possibility where it's like Karis Levert on an expiring and George Niang who was signed to a three-year contract and was pretty bad in his first year for the Cavs those two guys pretty much combined to make what Wiggins is making that um they make like 25 million and Wiggs makes 26 million it works financially would they be willing to do like Levert Niang and a lottery protected first round pick for Wiggins. I think Wiggins is a big upgrade for them over those two guys. It's just whether they're willing to take on the remaining three years of his contract based on what we saw last season. I, like, I still think that would be a significant upgrade, but is it enough to take on the contract and give up a first round pick in the process? The other thing is that all the Cavs first round picks are essentially... Um, owed to the Jazz anyway over the next few years for the Mitchell trade. I don't think they've got a first-round pick available to like 2030 or 31. Do they want to, even if they put a lottery protection on it, do they want to give up another first-round pick, which would then be going to the Jazz again, at which point is, you know, seven, eight years in the, you know, six, seven years in the future, which is beyond what Donovan Mitchell has just signed an extension for. I don't think they'd necessarily be wanting to do that. Not for Andrew Wiggins with three years and $84 million left on his contract. So I do think like Wiggins would be a significant upgrade on Levert and Niang, and I, I think that would actually work. But I'm just not sure. I'm not sure a pick would be going... Like I'm not sure the Cavs would be willing to throw a pick in there. Obviously, it would have to be heavily protected if they did. They don't have many first-round picks to play with as it is, given the Mitchell trade. Uh, but I did get on... like. If you're talking about just the pure finances of it, this works. It would be Karis LeVert, George Niang, Moses Moody to the Jazz, Wiggins to the Cavs, Markinen and Jordan Clarkson to the Warriors. And then the Warriors throw in all the first-round picks and first-round pick swaps they can to the Jazz, and then the Jazz also get an additional, say, lottery-protected 2030 first-round pick from the Cavs. Like, that's... That's the closest thing I could come to. But again, I, and maybe the Jazz would go for that. Maybe they wouldn't because they'd think, well, if we deal with Clarkson separately, we could get another first-round pick or two for him. Um, who knows? I actually think the Cav I think the Jazz might go for that. I just don't think the Cavs necessarily would. Uh, again, do you want to be taking on Wiggins' contract? It's just, it's just As much as that report was kind of nice to hear. It was like, oh yeah, this is a way that the Warriors can kind of get off Wiggins and get Mark at the same time. Because I think that would be the best outcome, which I've spoken about before on this podcast, is that if you get Mark and while keeping Kaminga, you've got to pay those two guys. Therefore, you literally can't have Wiggins be on next season. You cannot have that. So if you can get rid of him now and in the same deal as getting Mark and in, that would be absolutely fantastic. I just do not see any NBA team, unless they've had a big night on the beers, i cannot see them giving up picks for Andrew Wiggins. I just cannot see that. Happy to be proven wrong. It'd be great for the Warriors if I'm proven wrong, but I cannot see that. Um, last thing on kind of the market and trade discussions, uh, going back to the latest episode of the Low Post with Zach Lowe and Tim McMahon, McMahon stated that he believes that Brandon Pajemski would have to be part of a deal to Utah to get marketing and actually kind of stated that, hey, or suggested that, the Jazz might value pods over Kaminga, which makes a little bit of sense. And there's perhaps a defining reason as to why they might value pods over JK. And that is the contract situation. And that is the simple fact of it is that from 2025, 26, you're probably going to have to be, sorry, you're probably going to have to be paying Jonathan Kaminga in excess of $30 million. And if you don't extend him now and he has a huge, huge fourth season, which would be fantastic in itself, but it would also mean you're paying the guy upwards of 40, perhaps $50 million a season, as opposed to Pods, who has got three years left on his contract at less than $13 million. So for two years, for two years, you're essentially going to be paying Jonathan Kaminga $60 million, let's say minimum, if you ask for 30 mil a season, minimum $60 million for two years of Jonathan Kaminga, or would you prefer... Brandon Pajemski for two years on eight nine million dollars, and that is a like that's a big part of it, especially for a rebuilding team like the Jazz, who want to have as much financial flexibility going forward as they can. 
And so I can absolutely see them actually valuing pods over JK and saying to the Warriors, you can keep JK, you can keep Kaminga, because we don't really want to pay that guy. We need pods, though. The other thing about pods as well is I think that he's actually probably a little bit more versatile than JK. Like, with JK, scoring is his absolute number one asset. Absolutely unstoppable at the rim, but you kind of need to create an offense around that to a degree, and we've been you know, speaking about that with the Warriors in terms of you need to put high IQ guys around him, you need to put a lot of shooting around him as well to really make him um, not the fulcrum of your offense because Steph is going to still be that, but a guy that you put into in position to succeed significantly, uh, as I think they did at points last season. And I, think, I think there was a really good balance of points last season of J.K., delving into who the Warriors are, but also the Warriors delving into who JK is. And I'll, essentially, because they are, they're different. They're different, right? J- Jonathan Kaminga isn't a typical high IQ, read and react warrior player, but that doesn't mean he should be trying to completely fit into that. It should be, okay, we'll meet in the middle and create an offense that brings the best out of both of us, if that makes sense. Uh, even though I don't, I don't want to try and sound like the Warriors and Jonathan Kaminga are two different entities because Jonathan Kaminga is part of the Warriors. But I hope you know what I'm kind of getting at there. Uh, and, and going back to the Jazz, I think that there's a similar situation that would have to happen with Utah there. And I just think in terms of their young core, uh, I think Pods, just with his extra versatility in terms of being able to play on or off the ball, handle the ball a bit, play make a little bit, shoot a little bit, all this kind of stuff, he might be a more seamless fit amid among their young core than, than JK is. And then, of course, obviously the defining factor is, is the contractual situation. Uh, so moving on from that, just before I go, some quick thoughts on some league. The Warriors wrapped up the California Classic yesterday, lifting the Mitch Richmond Trophy, going 3-0 and after wins over the Heat, the Lakers, and then the Kings yesterday where they nearly had a disastrous collapse. I was watching the second half, getting a bit of PTSD because I was like, I've literally watched this like nine or ten times with the actual Warriors team over the last 12 months. This is depressing. Uh, they were up 21 in the first half. Pods had a, a good start to the game, 12 points, two rebounds, four assists in the first half. Uh, as I said, Warriors got up 21. And then second half, Keon Ellis, who's a very impressive young player, obviously played well against the Warriors in that playing tournament game a few months ago. He ended up with a 30-piece, and uh, he had a shot at the buzzer to win the game. Fortunately missed, so the Warriors uh, finished 3-0, flawless California Classic record-wise. Uh, Pods was disappointing, you'd have to say, in the second half. Um, went 0-5 from the floor, did not add a rebound or an assist, did not score at all until the final minute where he went 3-4 of four from the free-throw line, which, in fairness, was clutch enough to win them the game, so he did something there. Uh, it's very interesting to see... Like, I have a lot higher interest in watching him play than, like, TJD. TJD had 11.6 rebounds. I I don't really care, to be honest. I, I enjoy watching him play. There's no doubt about that. But what he does actually out on the floor, I'm looking at it like, okay, this guy's 24 years old. I don't think he's ever going to be a superstar player by any means. He can be a very high-end role player, no doubt about that. I don't think he's ever going to be a superstar or an all-star level player or anything like that. I don't really... I, I I actually feel confident about what I'm going to get out of TJD next season. And it's much the same as what we got in his rookie season. It's like, yep, guy's going to probably average... You know, he can average 20, 25 minutes a game maybe. And he's going to have nights where he gets double-doubles. I don't know. He might average 10 and 8 on the season or something like that. 10 and 7. Like, I actually... Pretty, feel pretty confident out, out of what I'm going to get from TJD next season. Pods is the one where it's like, this guy's coming out talking about how he wants to be most improved player next season, wants to become a second star for Steph, wants to become an all-star in the future. And I'm looking at this like, okay, let's let's see it. Show us. Um, so I'm actually really interested to watch him play. And the second half was disappointing. What I will say is he's clearly got an insane amount of confidence, which he probably needs to be careful that it doesn't border on irrational confidence to be honest because uh he's coming out and saying all these things and then you know he goes out yesterday and shoots four of 13 from the field which isn't great the one thing i would say is like you'd right and i think we said this about jordan Poole a bit is you'd rather have a guy that's uber uber confident and try and rein that in a little bit 
more so than a guy who's got no confidence whatsoever. Like you'd rather you'd rather have the guys like Pods and, and JP and whatever else. And uh, in fairness to Pods yesterday, it was good to see him play as the primary point guard to handle the ball, uh, made some nice passes, made some nice reads, took a lot of threes, wasn't hesitant to chuck them up or chuck up shots in general, which I think is a positive to see after a rookie year where a lot of fans were frustrated about the fact that he was passing up on on open three-point opportunities. So uh, not a good second half, good first half. Uh, He'll play, it sounds like he'll play the first couple of games in Vegas and kind of reassess from there. But I'm certainly... I'm intrigued to watch him play based on just what he's been saying recently in terms of his goals for next season, um, his aspirations to be a second star for Steph and all those kind of things, rather than TJD, who I just don't think needs to be playing, <laughs> really. Like, I think you look at Pods and, you, and he's actually going to have a significant role next season as right now, based on this roster, as the backup point guard, essentially, is what they kind of they kind of see him as going into next season and uh that is certainly you know providing a a point of interest watching here in summer league is okay how does he handle the point guard duties and he got outplayed by Keon Ellis yesterday in terms of opposing guards and um that's not necessarily a great thing to see but again Keon Ellis is older he's 23 24 pods is pods is 21 and so yes he's going into his second season but I think you do need to take the age into account as opposed to someone again like TJD who's 24 um, just to finish off, Kevin Knox led the Warriors with 19 points, 6 of 8, shooting 3 of 5 from 3-point range. He's not going to be on the Warriors roster, right? He's not eligible for a two-way for starters, so that kind of limits his chances uh, as he is. He's he's not going to be on the Warrior roster. He does intrigue me, though, because he's like this six seven forward, pretty good athlete, can theoretically shoot, where it's like he has... Nights like yesterday, where he you know goes three or five from deep, and he's not hesitant, like he's he's putting them up. Uh, but then you look at his career shooting percentages, and it's what is he like low thirties probably. Uh, so he's like a theoretical shooter, looks good, takes plenty, doesn't necessarily make them at a rate you need. Uh, so he's an interesting player. He's a player you could argue has never been in the right system or ever really on a good team to be able to try and maximize his talents. Uh, Maybe we'll see him, you know, push his case further uh, coming into summer league here. I do hope that, like, if if he does that, that some team has a look at him. I don't think, again, I don't think it'll be the Warriors because they just don't have the roster spots available, which, again, makes this summer league far less interesting than what it has in previous years when, at this point, they have a couple of roster spots kind of open and and there's actually real chances for players to push their case for a roster spot or a two-way deal or whatever else. Uh, but Kevin Knox is interesting. He's interesting. Former ninth overall pick. Clearly got talent. No doubt about that. Might just be a case of, you know, finding the right situation for him. And could that be at the Warriors? Again, it's very unlikely, but we'll see what he can do for the rest uh, rest of Summer League in Vegas. Other than that, guys, I'll finish it up there. Thank you for watching or listening again. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. I'll leave a link in the description to our new Reddit community. I think one person has joined so far in the last couple of days. Who cares? I'll stick at it. We'll see how we go. Um, otherwise, you can keep the, um, continue the conversation in the comments as well. You can follow me at POC252. That's P-O-K-252 on X slash Twitter. Other than that, I'll see you in the next episode.